of our galaxy from stellar kinematics, from the orbit of stars. So that's a very good question. Um, so for from the stars you know, you don't know, because the stars, the closest they get is about 1,000 uh, RG, 1,000 gravitational radii. From the gas that is orbiting around the black hole, you can have information about the rotational state. But I would say this is still pretty much an unsolved issue. So uh, there are there is marginal evidence that is a rotating black hole, but the event horizon telescope that is uh, currently online will actually reveal much more about the spin of our uh, black hole than what we currently know. What, what's the evidence for this dark matter? The, so what they see um, is um, they, they are actually imaging now. With the Event Horizon Telescope, they can... No, 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 no. The rotation. You said there's some marginal evidence for this. So what, what people do is to do uh, general optimistic MHC simulations, uh, and they can produce synthetic images of what the appearance of the black hole will be. Uh, in the case of a, a maximally rotating black hole, there are non-rotating black hole, and then compared to the Event Horizon Telescope images. They don't have those yet. They don't have those yet. No, no. They don't oh, have I those. You said, did you initially say there's some evidence for this rotating? There, are, there is other evidence from the um, still from from the imaging close to the black hole. We can, we can talk about this later. Okay. I don't want to stop at my first slide. Um, so what I'm um, interested in is actually not the uh, stellar dynamics, but more the gas that is around the black hole. Um, <laughs> and the information about the, the gas was uh, recently revealed by the Chandra X-ray telescope, so looking at the X-ray band, um, which only, uh, however, looks at very large scales. This allows to probe the nature of the, and the properties of the gas on scales of about 100,000 times the gravitational radius. This is so-called the Bondi radius, that's where the accretion is uh, coming from, very large distances. And uh, nowadays, and uh, in the next few years, the Event Horizon, Event Horizon Telescope will actually give much more detailed information of what the structure of the flow is on uh, scales that are comparable to the gravitational uh, radius. The um, outer scale, so the plasma, the gas that is uh, residing at the outer distances um, is collisional. And by collisional, I mean that uh, the mean free path for interaction of uh, particles uh, is comparable or smaller than the size of the system. So scales that I'm looking at at the outer boundary are about 10 to the 5 the horizon scale. Uh, and with the parameters of the flow that the Chandra telescope is measuring, the two kV in temperature and the 100 centimeters uh, to the minus 3 for the density, one can infer the mean free path, the distance a particle will uh, take before colliding with another particle. This is 10 to the 16 centimeters. And that's 0.1 of the distance. So the gas is marginally collisional uh, at these distances. Um, the related path, but not necessarily uh, closely related, is the path that the time taken for electron and proton to reach the same temperature is comparable to the characteristic dynamical time of the system, which is the distance divided by the sound speed. This is 100 <coughs> years or so. The electron-proton thermalization time is 1,000 years. So it's marginally longer, but not orders of magnitude uh, longer. Things do change once you get further in. Uh, and I'm here I'm taking an intermediate distance as a reference distance. Things will get even more extreme once getting even closer to the black hole. And the distance that I'm taking is about 100 uh, RG, 100 uh, gravitational radii, or 1,000 of that order. And if you compute the mean free path, the distance for a particle to interact with another particle at that distance is about 1,000 uh, to 1 million times larger than that distance. So the chance for a particle to collide with another particle at that distance is very, very small. This system is called a collision-less system. So very sure there are no uh, collisions among the uh, charged particles that are present in such a system. And is this true at every angle? Or so the estimates here are true for the uh, plane of the disk, uh, which is the situation of the higher density. So I would expect it to be even more true at higher latitudes, so the density is smaller, because the mean free path does depend on this. So what does collision let mean? And let me introduce a few uh, time and length scales that will come back over and over during my uh, presentation. The uh, first characteristic time scale for a 
uh, gas of electrons and protons or a plasma uh, is the plasma frequency, which is defined here. It only depends on the plasma uh, density. And it's basically the characteristic frequency for a gas of electrons and protons. Once you displace one species, it will come back as a result of the electric force. And it will oscillate back and forth with a characteristic frequency that is indeed the plasma frequency. With the plasma frequency, you can construct a length, which is the Debye length, the thermal speed divided by the uh, plasma frequency. This is the characteristic length over which, if you were to place uh, charged particles inside a plasma, the particle would be streamed. So the effect of that charge will not be significantly felt. It will be exponentially suppressed over a distance that is larger than the, uh, the by length. And um, instead of the thermal velocity, if you were to use the speed of light, you would obtain something that is called spin depth, uh, which characterizes how much penetration uh, you can have into the plasma by electromagnetic waves. And finally, the Larmor frequency, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it. This is just the frequency of rotation of a charged particles around uh, the magnetic field. So this um, various lengths or these various time scales are actually uh, conveniently ranked. Uh, the smallest time scale of the system is often the inverse electron plasma frequency. So when this is defined for electrons, this is the smallest time scale of the system. Um, and then you have the uh, type from time, the inverse of the larger frequency of electrons. Same quantity for the ions, and then and so on and so forth. And as you move to the right, you eventually get for the uh, parameters that are relevant for the accretion flow at the center of our galaxy to be electron ion collision time. So all this time is much larger than any other time, which is another statement, uh, as I said before, that the system is uh, collisionless. This is for time scales. You can construct a similar uh, hierarchy for length scales from the, the by length, which is the smallest scale of the system, the larger radius of electrons, and so on and so forth, the spin depth, uh, all the way up to the uh, large scale of the system. So that's um, terminology. I just wanted to define different quantities that will be coming back uh, repeatedly. And the uh, strategy that I'm using to describe this uh, collision-less system um, is uh, the so-called kinetic plasma uh, simulation tool. And let me spend just a few slides describing what the technique is. So we start from the uh, collisionless glass of equation, which is uh, shown here is basically the conservation in phase space of the six-dimensional distribution function f for a species s in this case. Um, this Lagrangian derivative being to equal to zero means that the phase space is not changing along characteristics. We follow characteristics in uh, velocity and uh, coordinate space, uh, and the distribution function is not changing. It's conserved. This is a, a manifestation of using of theorem. But now we need to put a little bit more physics. We have a gas of electrons and protons, a gas of charged particles. Um, so the uh, dx over dt that appears here, uh, one uh, writing it with partial derivatives instead of this Lagrangian derivative, the dx over dt is just the velocity of the particle. And the uh, derivative of the velocity over time, uh, in this case I'm assuming the, the particles are non relativistic, but the assumption will have to be relaxed afterwards, uh, is equal to the Lorentz force. Uh, electric and magnetic fields acting on the particle. The dv dt is coming from the interaction with the uh, magnetic fields. And you plug that in here, and you obtain this um, equation for the six-dimensional phase space density, which is uh, glass of equation. And from glass of equation, you can actually derive uh, all of the fluid equation that uh, you're probably familiar with. If you take the zero small length of uh, glass of equation, you obtain the conservation of the number of particles. Um, if you take the first moment, you obtain the uh, equation for the momentum of a given species. You see the mass here, velocity. This is the equation for the momentum, and so on and so forth. Eventually, you run into a closure problem. But the message that I want just to, to give is that from glass of equation, you can obtain all of the fluid equation. We'll stick to glass of equation first. Sorry, what, what's wrong with that equation? The density as being the first, the zeroth moment of the distribution function. So the density of particles in a given uh, position is just the integral of the distribution function over the velocity scale. So that's my definition of the zeroth moment. And the first moment is the integral of the distribution function times the velocity. We will, this will be the mean velocity of the, of the distribution. 
So how do you solve this? Um, here in America, it's quite hard to solve this brute force. Um, this is a, a six-dimensional state space, and you need to integrate it over time. So it's a, a seven-dimensional uh, problem in some sense, which is very hard to tackle uh, numerically. Um, instead of uh, solving it for the distribution function, you actually discretize the distribution function itself. And uh, once you do that, uh, and actually uh, even before doing that, let me, let me just specify one more thing, that the electric and magnetic fields here that are appearing in the Glass's equation are actually obtained self-consistently from the charged particles themselves. You have a distribution of charges, and this distribution of charges can give you both the charge density and the current density. So the uh, Poisson's equation for the electric field uh, is just obtained by integrating the distribution function over the velocity space with the appropriate charge <laughs> of that species. And similarly, the current, which enters uh, the force Maxwell equation, is obtained by integrating the distribution function and times the velocity in velocity space. So the system is closed in this case. Um, the electric and magnetic fields here in the Vlasov part of the system are given by the Maxwell equation, in which, as a source term, you still have the distribution function. So um, the system is closed. But you, you don't have a gravitational system here that so will come later? Or everything that I was describing is assuming that the forces in between particles are controlled primarily by electromagnetic fields. And but, but uh, there could be a material force in this case. The, yeah, so you can put the gravitational force or any other force, like a pressure force on an external field as external ingredients. The, uh, for both problems that I will be tackling, the effect of this external force on the time scales that I can resolve in the simulation is extremely small, so I'll be neglecting this. Uh, but it's a straightforward implementation. You don't need to worry about this coupling between this guy being sourced by the distribution function itself and modifying the distribution function for itself. It's an easy addition. Okay, so um, we have the option to solve this in six-dimensional state space. What is the other option? The other option is to discretize the distribution function for the species F as a sum over individual uh, simple distribution functions. And these individual simple distribution functions are in reality particles that we have been using to uh, discretize the state space. So instead of evolving the six dimensional distribution function, we follow uh, Lagrangian trajectory of macro particles, macro charged particles, uh, that are sensing the state space uh, density. And uh, the constancy of the distribution function required by Liouville's theorem translates into the charge of these individual particles staying constant uh, over time. So um, at that point, each uh, computational particle, each uh, individual distribution function will follow the Lorentz force. Uh, these two equations will be true for every individual uh, particle, and um, the current and the charge density will just be given by the uh, sum of delta functions depending on where the particles are with the appropriate charge or with the appropriate, appropriate charge times velocity for the current, and then used for Maxwell's equation. So this is the uh, basic method that we use. Instead of evolving the six-dimensional distribution function, we discretize it into individual particles, and then we follow the trajectory of the particles in a Lagrangian uh, way. Um, the only caveat is that you need to sample the distribution function with enough particles so that your results are uh, statistically meaningful and you're capturing all the effects uh, that the evolution of the six-dimensional distribution function will give you. Okay. So for the Maxwell case, you saw that you have Vienna zero potential, and you have Vienna zero potential or something like that? So the s speed of light is part of the problem. So uh, I don't have to worry about retardation effects of the speed of light. The um, two equations that I'm, uh, if, if it comes to chemical, let me know and I'll stop. But the um, Poisson's equations and uh, these V equations are not actually solved. Uh, these are not evolutionary equations. We start with an initial configuration that satisfies the equation. And then by uh, satisfying the two evolutionary equations, this one and this one, we automatically, uh, with a charge conservative algorithm, also ensure that these two are satisfied. So these two are really the only equations to uh, worry about. Um, and all of light travel effects, light time travel effects are 
um, included as part of the evolution of the equation. So if I were to have, for example, uh, two charges on top of each other initially, potentially zero everywhere, and then I displace them, uh, this would create an electromagnetic wave that would propagate out and transfer the information at the speed of light uh, everywhere else in the space. So this is the uh, so-called particle itself loop, uh, the fundamental uh, loops that we call it solving. Um, we can start from here, for example, the particle equation of motions are integrated um, in the Lorentz form. Um, and then uh, the current uh, that is obtained, the electric current that is obtained by pushing the particles around the grid is used to solve for Maxwell's equation. So now the current is coming from the individual particles. Uh, knowing Maxwell's equation, you solve for the uh, electric and the magnetic field, and you interpolate the electric and the magnetic fields back to the location of the particles, and then you're using the electromagnetic fields to push the particles around. So that's how the loop works. It's basically only Lorentz force and Maxwell's equations. You can add extra forces uh, if needed, um, but there are no other assumptions in that. Uh, this allows to capture all of the small scales that I anticipated at the beginning, both for the ions and for the electrons, especially the electrons are interesting because these are the dyes that are emitting, so the radiation, the light that we see through them is essential to interpret uh, black hole uh, emission signature. The um, challenge is that the time scales and the length scales for the electrons are extremely small, um, so the simulations often are very, very expensive and you need extrapolation to get from the uh, small scales where the plasma physics uh, is happening to the astrophysical scale. So let me start with the first part, um, electron heating and accretion flow. And um, <coughs> this is the uh, spectrum, this is the spectrum of light as a function of frequency that you see from the uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy, from the accretion flow around the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, these are wave, wave bands, this is the radio band, infrared, sub-millimeter. Um, the um, what I want to uh, focus on is that in order to model the spectrum, uh, people are typically inferring that you need electrons and ions not to have the same temperature, but uh, to have a temperature ratio that is about 0.1 to 0.3, maybe even smaller than 0.1 depending on the model, but definitely equal temperatures does not work. And uh, why one would expect to have in such a system a situation in which the electron temperature and the ion temperature are not uh, the same? Um, there are three main uh, physical reasons. One is that the electrons are cooling due to uh, radiative cooling uh, much more efficiently than the ions. Second, uh, second fact is that heating in general uh, favors the ions over the electrons, especially compressive heating uh, for parameters that are relevant for the accretion flow at the center of our galaxy. The electrons within uh, 1,000 gravitational radii are becoming marginally relativistic, so they're changing their adiabatic <coughs> index. The ions are still non-relativistic, and this implies that the electron temperature will grow like density to one-third, the ion temperature density to two-thirds, just a uh, different equation of states. So for the same compression, the ions will be heated more than the electrons. That's another reason for why the electrons will tend to be cooler than the ions in accretion, uh, in collisionless accretion flows. And finally, as I said at the beginning, these systems are collisionless, meaning that the frequency of Coulomb collisions that will help to make from two temperatures the same temperatures for the electrons and the ions are, uh, the frequency is extremely small. So the chance for the two species to become to equilibrium uh, due to collisional processes is quite uh, small. However, there might be uh, collisionless effects that are driving the two species uh, to the same temperature. And here I'm listing three, I will only be focusing on one. Um, the first one is uh, shock. So we, we heard about shock this morning already. Uh, my uh, one sentence uh, definition of shock, these are compression in density, pressure, and temperature that happen when you have a supersonic flow. Uh, this is true, for example, in supernova remnants, which are the remnants of exploding stars. In many astrophysical systems, the shocks are collisionless shocks. And we do see that uh, the energy, which is primarily in the ions initially, some of the energy is transferred <coughs> to the electrons. So shocks are a good way for uh, energy transfer from bulk kinetic energy to electron heat. The second process, which I will be focusing on at the end, is magnetic reconnection. 
This is a process by which magnetic field lines are annihilated, um, and their energy is released to the particles, uh, providing electron heating as well. Um, and finally, plasma instability. And here I will concentrate um, a little bit on ion velocity space instabilities. I will define what that is uh, as a mechanism for uh, electron heating. So I will, I will mostly focus on the third uh, aspect. And um, ion and velocity space instabilities are uh, seen in the solar wind um, spacecraft that are sent out uh, to the Lagrangian point close to the Earth do see the effects of these instabilities. Uh, this is the reason for why this boundary and this boundary is present. Here I'm plotting the ratio of the uh, perpendicular to parallel temperature of ions, perpendicular and parallel with respect to the local magnetic field, as a function of the plasma beta, where beta is the ratio of the gas pressure to the magnetic pressure. So the dotted lines are the prediction for these instabilities. And you, all of the dots here are observations of the plasma. You see that there is nothing that exceeds the threshold of these instabilities. So these instabilities are uh, really observed uh, in the solar wind. So what is the role uh, in the context of accretion disk? This is uh, one of the state-of-art, uh, state-of-the-art simulations of accretion flows. Uh, color coding. I'm sorry, it doesn't read well. Color coding is the ratio of the gas pressure to the magnetic pressure, uh, so the same beta parameters that I described. Uh, and especially um, colors that are blue or black are um, cases in which the magnetic field uh, dominates. But um, everywhere in the accretion disk, um, what happened, and that's actually the whole nature of how an accretion disk works, uh, you have amplification of magnetic fields as a result of shear or compression. And the amplification of the magnetic field has a distinctive uh, signature uh, in the case that the plasma is collisionless. Uh, there is a quantity which is called the uh, first adiabatic invariant or magnetic moment for a single charged particle, um, which um, is very well conserved if the external magnetic field changes slowly. So that's by definition what an adiabatic invariant is. Um, it's something that is nearly conserved uh, when the magnetic field changes slowly with respect to the motion, uh, the gyro motion of the particle around the magnetic field itself. So you see that if the magnetic field increases, as indeed is expected in accretion disk, the perpendicular energy, forgive me about perpendicular energy, the component of the velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field will also increase uh, as well. The parallel component will not increase. So this results uh, into a distribution function for the particle that was initially isotropic, and now it's squeezed. It's uh, staying uh, length along the magnetic field, but it increases in the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. This is what an anisotropy uh, is in the distribution function, and this configuration is unstable. So we'll study what happens once you relax that uh, anisotropy. And for that, we will look at a simulation that is local into the accretion disk, so there won't be uh, local effects uh, concerning uh, rotation of the accretion disk or GR, but the purpose is just to clarify what are the physical processes that, have, that are happening in a local patch of the disk. And um, this is the way we limit uh, a large-scale amplification of the magnetic field within the particle itself, the Fick equation. Um, we assume to have a magnetic field that is initially around along the X direction, and we define a compression matrix. Compression uh, is just to uh, amplify the field. It could be shear. Shear can also amplify the field, but the conclusions are actually the same. So this is a compression matrix. We cube uh, the compression rate, how fast it's uh, compressed, as a function of the frequency of gyration of ions in the background field. Um, and you can see how the equations that we're solving, Maxwell's equations and the Lorentz force, are changing at first order in the um, limit of no relativistic compression speed, which is always well uh, satisfied. So you can uh, just rewrite the equation, solve the same system, but just with the uh, matrix entering either the matrix or the first derivative of the matrix uh, entering your equation. So you can still keep the same uh, algorithm, the same formula. And what do you get out of this? <coughs> so what we do is to um, include in the peak equations a self-consistent uh, evolution of the magnetic field, amplified magnetic field, 
and the plasma will uh, result in uh, having an anisotropy, and anisotropy will relax producing instability. And uh, this is a one um, plot picture of what kind of instabilities you have. The magnetic field is oriented this way, and we vary the initial temperature from um, of the electrons directed to the proton between unity down to 13 minus 2. Uh, as I said, most likely would be somewhere in this regime for the uh, realistic accretion flow around uh, the galactic state. And the stability changes nature, as you can see. For equal temperature, you primarily have this oblique mode. This is called mirror instability, but um, I will not have time to discuss the, the physics of the instability itself. Um, for lower temperatures, temp uh, 0.3 down to 17 minus 2, you have another instability growing and eventually dominating. Uh, as shown here, it's a different instability. It's called ion cyclotron. It's basically relying on the motion of the ions around the magnetic field. This goes unstable and drives these uh, waves which are propagating along the uh, magnetic field. So for low um, electron to proton temperature ratios, the ion cyclotron mode is expected to dominate. And now what we can do is to build uh, an analytical model for how much you would expect the electrons to be heated whenever this instability is occurring. And um, the uh, growth of the instability is exemplified here in the growth of the magnetic field or in the electric field for different values of the initial temperature ratio. And um, the top right panel is a characterization of uh, electron heating. So these instabilities do lead to electron heating. Uh, we can measure how much the electrons are heated in our simulation. We can compare that with the dots here. These are the predictions of our uh, theory. The predictions work well. So what we did is very simple. We'll just <coughs> look at the local patch of the uh, accretion flow and study one possible channel for electron heating where we have many more um, uh, options that are currently underway for different heating channels. Ultimately, uh, what we uh, want to do, and we have all the tools for doing that, is to put this recipe for uh, electron heating motivated by these fully consistent simulations into a global uh, general relativistic uh, MHC evolution of the accretion flow. Currently, the global MHC is done, but uh, assumes uh, high levels of collisionality. So all of these processes, including the physics of electron heating due to collisionless processes, is not included. The accretion flow at the center of our galaxy is collisionless. So such processes have to be included. The subgrid models that we are developing, and together with the general relativistic uh, MHC simulations that uh, the Harvard um, CSA group has, will allow to model the accretion disk, uh, collisionless accretion disk, fully uh, self-consistent. And uh, for the last 10 minutes, I would like to abandon the accretion disk um, that we have focused on so far and look at the jet. Um, very often, um, sort of like so-called fixed accretion disks uh, in which the uh, disk height over ratio is over uh, distance to support a unity are associated with jets. Uh, this is not the case now for our own galactic center. Uh, it might have been uh, the case in the past. And, um, but definitely in, in other galaxies there is this uh, evidence that black holes at the centers of galaxies do uh, power uh, relativistic jets. And um, these are the most possibly interesting objects to look at. They're called blazers. Uh, they're uh, relativistic jets from active galactic nuclei uh, at the centers of galaxies. Uh, in the case that the jet is pointing right uh, along our line of sight. So this is not a blazer. This would be a blazer, jet pointing right at us. And uh, they are characterized by uh, um, amazing uh, spectral energy distribution, amazing uh, light uh, detection, amazing light, light signatures. Um, you can see that the spectrum, as you see, it spans over almost two uh, orders, um, almost 20 orders of magnitude in uh, frequency. So it's surprisingly, surprisingly uh, wide. It's characterized by two broad bumps. The low energy bump is thought to be powered by synchrotron emission. This is emission from charged particles around a magnetic field. The high energy bump is Hilbert Compton from 
uh, soft photons that are upscattered to higher energies by relativistically hot uh, electrons. Um, there are three properties, four properties of these objects that I would like to uh, focus on and uh, try to explain, still with the same uh, kinetic tools that I described at the beginning. The first one is that lasers are efficient in emitting light. About 10% of the overall power of the jet goes into radiation. The second property is that quite universally, quite commonly, uh, they're seen as having same amount of energy in the electron, the radiating species, and in the magnetic field. The third property is, is that, as I said, they're characterized by this very broadband uh, distribution of uh, light. Um, this translates into a, into a very broadband distribution of particles. <coughs> Can you put too much energy in the magnetic field? So you, you model the emission, uh, and since you have both bumps, they're coming from the same population of particles. This is due, giving you an independent handle on how much energy you have in the particles and how much energy you have, you have in the field. But everything goes. I thought you said that the right hand bump is like up there and a cross right down. Yes. But the soft photons are actually provided by the synchron photons themselves. So first generation of electrons, they produce synchron photons. That's part of what we see. Some of the synchron photons will be upscattered to higher energies by the same population of electrons. And the two things at the same time allows you to have a handle on both the particle content and the magnetic content. Electrons that are upscattered and the photons are the same ones that are synchrotron. That's a very good question, actually. So this is true in some objects. This is not true in all objects. And you do see that by looking at optical emission. So but optics that weird that it's separated by like 10 orders of magnitude. No, that's because the particles are actually very relativistic. So how much the upscattering is happening, it's gamma squared, where gamma is the rank factor of the particles. So the particles that are radiating here are really ultra relativistic. The electrons are 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 in the rank factor. So this explains the separation between the two species. The physics is very, I, sh I should say, I should mention this. The physics is very solid for a class of objects in which we do not have any other evidence for external photon fields being important. If external photon fields are the main source of the soft photons, then these constraints are much less uh, sort of like powerful. But in a class of objects in which you do see that there are no other external sources of photons, the same electrons are producing synchrotrons, the synchrotron photons are being upscattered by these ultra relativistic electrons, so this is the second one. And finally, the fourth property is about the time variability. You, you do see variability time scale from the jet on 10 minutes, and 10 minutes is actually less than the light crossing time across the black hole horizon for such objects, 10 to the 9 solar masses. So it's extremely fast time scales, uh, which are hard to explain if you think that the minimum variability time scale is set by the black hole horizon. Let me skip this. So this is what we see. Um, laser jets are seen uh, often in radio as these blobs of uh, polarized uh, light. Uh, the question is what is actually powering this block? Uh, what is the mechanism that is providing the dissipation that uh, eventually results in uh, light? And uh, the paradigm that I will be using is that uh, it's assuming that magnetic reconnection has a role in powering this system. So reconnection is a process by which magnetic field lines of opposite polarity, uh, blue and red here, are uh, converging at the center in a region that is called X point. Here, the particle current is not sufficient to sustain the curl of the magnetic field. So the field has to rearrange its topology. And that's why you form this half blue, half red uh, field lines on the two sides. The regime of reconnection that is most relevant in uh, jet-dominated systems is laser jet. It's called relativistic reconnection, in which the magnetic energy per particle uh, is larger than unity. So if all of the magnetic energy were to be transferred to the particles, uh, the particles will become uh, ultra relativistic. And this is how reconnection looks like. Um, you start with a magnetic field that is oriented to the left and to the right, separated by this 
in this region, which is called current sheet. Uh, we'll only look at what happens in the current sheet as a function of time. Uh, this is the result of a cell phone system uh, fit simulation. You see that uh, structures which reconnection does produce, uh, they transition to larger and larger scales. At the same time, uh, your quantity produced in the density, these small structures constantly uh, in the current sheet, they grow, into, they grow to larger and larger uh, scales over time. The uh, most interesting thing, uh, if I will have time to actually explain that, is that the uh, plot of the magnetic minus electric energy shows a region in blue, for example, here and, and here, in which the electric field is actually larger than the magnetic field. So the MHD approximation here fails. If you place a particle there, the particle will be very efficiently accelerated by the electric field. So these are very promising regions for particle acceleration. Um, this is a structure of the inflow and outflow of the reconnection region. The plasma comes in this way at low relativistic speeds, about 0.1 of the speed of light, and then uh, it escapes to the left and to the right at ultra relativistic speeds, approaching the so-called Alfen speed. This is the speed of wave uh, in uh, uh, along the magnetic field, and the Alfen speed for these uh, conditions approaches <coughs> the speed of light. The uh, main reason we did this uh, is to look at uh, particle acceleration. Uh, particle acceleration, you need to look at 3D more than 2D. You can always suspect that a 3D picture will be different than a 2D picture. But in reality, you can see that at, the, at late times, uh, you form this island uh, that are merging. These are the same structures that you were seeing in 2D. And even the small scale flux cubes, the small scale structures are the reminiscence of the uh, two-dimensional small-scale island uh, that I was seeing, that we were seeing in uh, 2D objects. The uh, spectrum of the particle is another interesting thing to look at. Uh, this is the distribution of the particle energy uh, over a range of factors. Um, <coughs> and uh, you can see that it's not consistent with a Maxwellian distribution. It's close to a power law distribution with an index of uh, two. This is true for both two-dimensional results and three-dimensional uh, results. And over time, the maximum energy is uh, steadily increasing. The colors here are time. Uh, <coughs> this is also illustrated here with the maximum energy that is growing linearly with time. This is a uh, promising um, property of reconnection as a mechanism to accelerate particles to a very high energies in a relatively uh, short time. Let me just spend uh, one slide uh, on the acceleration mechanism. This is one of the particles that are uh, that is extracted from the simulation. This is one of the particles that are making up the electric current in the simulation. Uh, it's located here, right here over the density profile. And this is the Lorentz factor or energy of the particle as a function of time. You see that the particle is initially interacting with the uh, current sheet right now. And I stopped the movie. Uh, it currently will uh, grow now because the there is an electric field here uh, larger than the magnetic field, so the particle will just be accelerated along this uh, electric field. Uh, then the particle is trapped uh, in between, uh, in this island. Nothing will happen for a while until these two islands are merging. You have a free energy in the motion, rapid motion of the two islands. The energy is given to the particle. That's why the energy of the particle goes up. So there are two stages of acceleration. The first interaction in the current sheet, and then once the particle is uh, advanced into the island, uh, in between the two islands, the particle energy will go up, coming from the free energy of the conversion, uh, convergence of the two islands. So let me conclude with the implications for blazers. Um, I mentioned that blazers are, yeah. Are these things just, just within your current set that's trapped by the force field or something? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so the regime of very high sigma is um, in the extreme limits of sigma infinity, a force-free regime. However, um, sorry, what was this? The magneti magnetization, the ratio of the magnetic energy to the rest mass energy of the particle. So in the limit of uh, this ratio going to infinity, this will become force-free. Uh, however, for uh, the balance of the forces, you need the particle pressure in the islands. And the particle pressure initially is zero, but after reconnection happens, 
reconnection actually gives half of the initial, more or less half of the initial magnetic energy to the particle. So the system of the islands balancing with the inflow will not be described by force field. But, but force field is defects. Yeah. Force field with localized defects where the islands are. And the place where these field lines recombine, is, 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 that, a, is, that, a, is that a current, current sheet? sheet. Is that a, so it's not a jet, right? This is a current sheet. All of these structures are inside the jet. So, so the force field breaks down there? Yes. At the, at the reconnection? Yes. And you will need that in order to have dissipation, in order to have acceleration of particles, in order to have radiation. If your jet were to be pointing flux dominated and staying pointing flux dominated, there will be no emission signature out of that. And these current sheets, current sheet defects, can they be described by some equation or? or so or within, within force free or within <coughs> resistive relativistic MHC, you can describe them as localized resistivity. Uh, so you can, if you want, you can use like a resistive relativistic MHD approach and uh, characterize the resistivity of the current sheet. In here, the resistivity is given by the shape of the particle distribution, which is consistently evolved as part of the equation. So there are no assumptions about the, the, the shape of the resistivity there. So let me just finish with three bullet points because I'm uh, running out of time. Um, Relativistic reconnection is efficient. We said 10% of the energy should go into uh, radiation. And uh, if we look at the reconnection layer, we find that the, the efficiency of the process that we find the, as the ratio between how much energy we put into the particles that can emit light, electrons in this case, uh, versus the overall energy of the system is about 15% for an electron positron jet, 25% for an electron proton jet. So reconnection does satisfy the observation requirements. Same thing for the equipartition between the electron and the magnetic energy. Uh, we observe them to be in equipartition, meaning that uh, this ratio of electron energy divided by the sum of the two should be around 0.5. Reconnection does tell force system to give 0.5, so it's a good answer for the equipartition condition as well. Um, and finally, it does give the non-thermal, uh, very extended non-Maxwellian particle distribution. Um, as I, I focus on the case of sigma magnetic energy over uh, resonance energy of the plasma equals 10, which gives us log of 2, a power of log of 2. This log is a function of the magnetization. For lower magnetization, it's steeper. For uh, higher magnetization, it's uh, harder. So uh, reconnection seems to satisfy a lot of uh, requirements of laser emission, um, including the fast time variability. I will just catch it now. Uh, we have more... Uh, uh, quantitative work in progress. The basic idea is that uh, there are individual structures in the current sheet, these plasmoids that you were seeing in the movie, these magnetic islands, small magnetic islands. When they're moving relativistically towards the observer, they can actually give very fast time variability on a 10 minute time scale, even shorter than the light passing time of the black hole horizon. Uh, this is a justification uh, for the time variability, but my time is also up, so I'll just conclude. Uh, thank you very much. So yeah, let me just, yeah, just three bullet points. Uh, the accretion flow at the center of our galaxy is conditionless. Um, so collision reentry path is much larger than the size of the system. This cannot be described in MHD. Uh, you need to have a subgrid model that is a collisionless description of the plasma, and then this subgrid model can be used within an MHD uh, framework. Um, there are like, studies that are underway for understanding why the temperature ratio in accretion flows, collisionless accretion flows, is not unity, but it's less than unity. What are the heating channels, shock reconnection, and uh, ion velocity space instabilities? And reconnection in jet uh, seem to be the most promising answer for what is giving us the uh, light, especially from lasers, but I would argue from uh, all relativistic jets in astrophysics. <coughs> Thank you very much.